Now, for I know some of you are saying, well, is Chris going to be here? Chris will be joining us in just a few moments. But we do have a Q&A area. We have a lot of people like to start asking some questions. So let's go ahead and start with our first question. Hello, everyone. It's hey. Andre, Erica. Hi. Hi. Uh, hello. Uh, great to see uh, some of you guys again. So uh, my question is, as you know, with some of the projects you are in, there are some that, you know, that are coming to an end or like, you know, that's like finishing, especially with uh, oh, Pokemon with Ash Ketchum eventually ending or Attack mm -hmm. on Titan ending this year. So mm -hmm. my question is, uh, for some of the parts that you were, uh, a, a franchises that you were a part in or like an anime series that you've been doing for so many years and now, how do you prepare for like, you know, when it's like the time for the end or like, you know, this is like... Uh, <laughs> oh, Chris! Oh, hi! Hi! hi. I was here her. all along. We did hear your question, though. Yeah. The question? Yeah, so you know, yes. what I was saying earlier is, you know, how do you prepare for, like, you know, like, oh, I love this character, or, like, man, I can't believe I've been doing this, uh, this voice role for so now, but now it's like, oh, my God, this is the end. How do I say prepare for, like, my final time voicing this character after so long? Uh, the emotional preparation has been uh, challenging. It's strange to not go to work after 17 years. It's very, it's the idea that I'm not going to be doing this every week is, is very strange. It's been my entire adult life. I've been so blessed to not ever wonder where, where my next job is going to be. So um, this, is a, this is definitely a change, but I think change is good. And I think it's great that an, uh, an animated series, we all watch animated series, I think, primarily for comfort, for nostalgia, for comfort and for laughs. And these are become our friends, these characters, right? Um, so I think it's very useful for an audience also to watch an animated series go through a change like that because that makes it easier for all of us to accept changes in our own lives. So, you know, I'm right here with you. I agree that it's sad, but after 25 years, I think it makes perfect sense for a kid to finally win a world championship and move on with his life. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's perfectly fine. But um, I'm here for you. I will always have had this. I'll always be your voice of Ash. If I'm your voice of Ash, I'll always be that for you. So yeah, it's been an honor. It's been great. Thank you for your question. All right, our next question. <laughs> I'm going to be calling you because at some point, yes. it might be 15 years from now, One Piece is going to finally end as well. So. Perfect, yeah, yeah, we'll talk. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll get you through it. <laughs> Dragon Ball was supposed to end, but they just keep they wishing, keep making it. wishing it back. Yeah, yeah. Cool. We, which is probably what will happen anyway. We, we probably said goodbye to Dragon Ball like five times. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is it. Oh, no, it's not. There's a game. Oh, no, it's not. There's a whole new series now. I was going to say, I feel like everything that I've been in that like ends, I'll build, uh, like a year later, they're like, it's a spin-off. Yeah. <laughs> We're yeah. back. So. Now, he, and he did mention Attack on Titan, and as far as the manga and everything is concerned, there's only like a little bit left to do. Yeah. So that should actually end. Uh, should, but it should. But well, well, <laughs> you never know. It, you never know. Uh, you never I am prepared for that only in the sense that, like, I know that it ends. I, I you know, book wise it ends, manga wise it ends. Uh, I have mixed feelings on saying goodbye to something like that because, yes, you know, you've been playing a character for a long time and, yes, you've been in this universe, but also from a, a d directing standpoint, because I'm the voice director of that show and a few others as well, um, it's nice to go like, okay, I have a complete story. I have a complete everything. Um, you know, we didn't, like, Sabbath didn't, like, move off to the moon or something in the middle of it and we had to keep, you know, like, replace him or something like that. I like all of those things, all of it to be tied and everyone from this point forward can go back and watch this thing as a complete package and it's a good story and, you know, like, you go back and watch Breaking Bad or Battlestar Galactic or whatever else you'd like to watch, it's still right there. Yeah. And then for people who've never seen it, it's new to them 20 years from now. Yeah. What I find funny, Mike, is that you literally have started some of the best series and then finished so many other amazing series. <laughs> like, you started Full Metal Alchemist, you started uh, Dragon Ball, you started, uh, uh, what was the other one? You started One Piece, right? Weren't you one of the original directors of One Piece? Yeah. And then while that was happening, you're like, oh, I'm just gonna take a break and direct a bunch of amazing series and then maybe come back to it someday. Yeah, well, well, well One Piece, I, it is a matter of having to come back to it someday, because it's like, I'm glad there are a lot of people that can work on this show, because it's too much show for one person. Yeah. I know what Mike's experience is working One Piece. He's like trying to do something else, but they come in and go, hey, what's this character? And what, how do you pronounce this? 
They're played by Kent Williams, and it's in episode 217, and I don't know why my brain remembers this information and not the names of elementary school teachers. Oh, my God. <laughs> next, all right, our next question. All right, this is for Sarah. Um, how did you, like, discover your voice of Ash, and do you uh, voice any other characters in the Pokemon series? Uh, so, Ash, uh, I... It, I was requested to do a voice match, so at the audition they were like, here's, here's what my predecessor sounded like, and uh, this is what we're trying to match, so it's not a jarring change. Um, so that's how it started out, but then over the course of my many years on the show, it kind of melded into my own thing, and that's what you're hearing today. Uh, for the Pokemon, I listen to either a voice that uh, is already pre-existing and I, I match that, or I create my own voice just based on what the character looks like and how, how they move and all that. Uh, or I listen, oh, and when I do that, I also listen to the Japanese and see what they did in the Japanese and if it makes sense to do for us, well, I do it. Yeah. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right, this is for the prince of all Saiyans and Master Roshi. So there is a YouTube channel called Team Four Star. I don't know if y'all have heard of it. And uh, they air a little series called Dragon Ball Z Abridged. I don't know if y'all have heard of it. I hear they are the hype. Yeah. They are the hype. I've, I've only heard about them for at least 15 years. Is it good? <laughs> Um, so, what do y'all think about the portrayal of those characters, like specifically Vegeta and especially Master Roshi, because they, they're kind of different? <laughs> I will say, like, I haven't been able to keep up with all of their work because it's, it's, it's huge at this point. Same. Uh, so, I, but I remember the first time I ever heard it, I'm like, damn, I better, I better keep my health up because that guy's going to steal my job someday. <laughs> but Lonnie's uh, Vegeta is amazing. And I think that you know, fan-based stuff like Team Four Star really, I think, went a long way in keeping Dragon Ball kind of very fresh and fun during a time when there really wasn't any other Dragon Ball content out there. So I think there's, there's many people who were introduced to Dragon Ball through Team Four Star. For sure, I've met some, yeah. yeah. They've mentioned, they're like, oh, I've watched that first. I think they're all extremely talented and I really look forward to seeing kind of what original stuff they can do because obviously it's a little tricky because they're using someone else's animation, right? Right. What Chris said. <laughs> Agreed. I think that, I, I, want, to, I want to point something out. I think that people don't realize this. My, my really close friend, he's a voice actor. They, these guys are so incredibly talented. When you watch something on television or a movie, you can see the actor's face move and their facial tics, their eyebrows to help sell the performance. They're selling everything through their voice articulation, all the emotions that go through that. And that's such a talented that very few people can do it. I mean effectively well, and you guys are the best of the best. You guys are so good at that, so you guys are very talented. Well, right. thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Next question. Hi there. So my question is actually for Mr. Sabbath. Um, does it ever get awkward being the voice of everyone's animated heartthrobs? <laughs> well, it's nice that something about me is attractive to people. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, it's, it is really weird. I think so many people come up and they're like, hey, what's up? Uh, you don't look anything like those guys. Uh, but I sound like them, which is cool. And it is, uh, I have to sit through a lot of people pouring their hearts out to me as a conduit for another character. It is really strange. People come up and go like, hey, what's up, Vegeta? And I go, well, okay, let's say there is a, there, I'm a person too. <laughs> But it is really cool. Like, I, I think the thing that people love about coming by and seeing us is that we're kind of the closest thing to the show that's almost possible, unless you could meet the creator. Like, we're really close to it, and we're like one step closer. And I think it's, I think it's fun for people to meet us in that way. And it's awesome. I was very lucky. I recommend showing up uh, when they're building an anime studio somewhere and being the first person there. You get a lot of good roles that way. <laughs> so I shouldn't pour my heart out to you as Captain Yami. Oh, uh, yeah, duh. Take a nice dump, okay? I'll also say, it's, I, I'm a big proponent of, like, no, it's me as well. I did attend one convention as a fan a long time ago where I was like, this is really okay. Uh, Ryan Reynolds was there with, like, Guillermo del Toro to do, like, Blade Trinity. 
So it was that time frame in his career. So each person that came up to ask a question didn't say this is for Mr. Reynolds. They're like, I have a question for Van Wilder. And everything was for Van Wilder from the first, for the first person who went up there and asked the question like, Van Wilder, what did you think about when you killed the vampire? I'm like, they can ask Van Wilder questions. That's a deep cut. You can keep calling him that. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. My, my heart's doing this right now. Um, you guys were such a huge inspiration in my childhood, even adulthood. Um, inspire like my wife and I, even inside my wedding ring, All Might, it says till death plus ultra. Like you guys are a huge part of us. Uh, so I just want to know what characters inspire you all? If any. Oh man. Erica, do you want to go first on that one? <laughs> oh, I was having fun just listening to you guys. <laughs> um. Kim Possible was the first cartoon that I watched where I realized that there were like actors <laughs> behind it. Um, because Disney Channel used to, you know, they only have advertisements for their own stuff. Uh, so they had like a segment with Christy Carlson Romano and she was talking about doing the voice and she was like, you can work in your pajamas, it's great. And I was nine and I was like, wow, fantastic, I wanna do that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, it turns out you, I didn't work in my pajamas until the pandemic, so that was kind of a lie. But yeah, Kim Possible, uh, Teen Titans was another one that really made me want to get into voiceover. Um, Avatar The Last Airbender. Um, and, and Kingdom Hearts is like my favorite franchise ever. <laughs> and I, when I was a kid, I used to be like, let's, let's practice the scenes together with my friends who were like, what are you talking about? What are Aww. you weirdo? <laughs> so... Haha, ha. I, I made money off of it and they didn't. So, <laughs> so you win. And you have, I win. And you have continued playtime forever. Yes. And then I replay it and I think about how cool I was back <laughs> then. <laughs> cool. I started working on anime like when TVs were still made out of wood and stuff. And. <laughs> oh! <laughs> mic drop. Jeez. Yeah. Nice. I can. I was done. I'm wow. done All with right. the panel. She's <laughs> out. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, I grew up before the internet, so I really didn't, and we didn't have streaming television, and I was dumb, and I didn't know that voices, actually, you might have actually said that too, like, I didn't really realize that, like, cartoons had people's voices on them, I just thought they existed that way. Yeah. And so, where'd they film this? Everyone looked <laughs> drawn. Man, Kermit, he doesn't look the same in person. Um, the... And so a lot of my inspiration, I, I, I got hired to work on Dragon Ball in like 1998 when I was just really out of college. I'd done a lot of work on the radio. I'd done a lot of commercials, but I hadn't really done much voice acting. And voice acting wasn't even an option that, was, that you thought that was even possible. So I kind of stumbled into it. And I was really honestly inspired by a lot of the people I worked with along the way. Because when Funimation was first brand new, they could only pay like $17 an hour. So we could only basically use people who worked in the office to do the voices. And then once we started like paying a little bit more, we started getting people like Laura Bailey, who was freaking awesome at 17 years old. And Colleen Clinkenbeard and Lucy Christian and uh, Travis Willingham. And, and the, the, the list goes on and on. Kent Williams and there was this, as Mike can attest as a director, each, each, every few years we got this new class of actors and they were just getting better and better as we went on. It was How really exciting. They? I know, right? So yeah, I was, I was inspired by a lot of people I worked with for the most part. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Chris, and it's just more of a curiosity. When you're doing voice acting, uh, are you in the studio working with other actors that you're doing a scene with, or are you submitting things from home? How does that work? Well, it's, it's, we've gone through a whole cycle. During the pandemic, we did a lot of stuff from home. But anime is a very solitary thing. You go into a booth, and the only people you normally see are like the director and the engineer. Occasionally, you will come in with a group of people, but that's a, called a Walla session. That's where you're just doing all like the background voices. But it's a pretty solitary thing because the timing in anime is such a careful thing that if you had everybody in the booth at the same time, you'd spend half the session telling somebody to fix something, and it would take way too long. All right. Thank you. 
I think also they, I, I wanted to just kind of talk about the, to the, let the audience know because when you guys are in the uh, the sound booth and you were doing that recording, I've heard a lot of voice actors say that sometimes it's difficult because all of a sudden you, the director will just come and say, okay, good, and they'll move on to the next thing. There's not a lot of praise. They don't know, like, do you want me to do it different? Do you want me to do it better or bigger? And they just, they're just like, good, and the next scene, and move on. And so they said it's kind of sometimes it's difficult to get in that flow because just, it's just you, usually. I, I think initial, like, maybe in the first few sessions, but I think you get to the point where if they don't say anything, you keep moving on, and you're like, I did great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't have to do it again. Right. So, excellent. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> good. Hi, so this is a general question for all four of you. So I also want to get into voice acting, and I've just been told that like a lot of it is just about who you know. So like, who did you guys know that like got you your big break? Like, nobody. Who, who did you know to get you to Pokemon? Who did you know to get you to Dongan or Genshin or whatever? I, nobody. 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 Did you just find the auditions online somewhere? No, no. I took it, classes. And well, yeah. I lived in a different world, you know, the world that Sabbath came from as well. Uh, I, I trained as an actor and stuff like since elementary school, um, and through various means, you start looking around for where auditions happen if you're an actor and you're hungry and you want to work. You're like, oh, okay, the, uh, like we have a, a weekly magazine in Dallas called The Observer. In the back of The Observer sometimes, like, we're putting on a play, we're filming, but we're doing this stuff and we need actors. Or... Um, you might be lucky enough to live in a city that's big enough where they have some talent agencies. And you go in there and like, I would like to do talent things because I feel like I have some. And they'll go like, well, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Let's work together and find out. And then they'll send you on stuff. And depending on whether or not you book some stuff, they'll say, cool, keep going. Right. Like, stop yeah. it right yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, in some instances, there's always something like you know, but I don't think it's like it's required. Like it, 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 like it is neat. Like in the instance of you mentioned Laura Bailey and Colleen Clinkenbeard, Colleen uh, came in through Laura. Yeah. So she knew her, but like also Colleen came in knowing Laura, having had a, uh, an acting background and been on stage, and they were in a play together and they worked well together, which is why she brought her in. So she was like, like this is someone else that's really good. So. Yeah. Yeah. There. I didn't know anybody when I auditioned for Pokemon. I had. Um, done four years at acting school. I was pounding the pavement, looking for an agent, looking for a manager. I started freelancing with an agency. And it was through a, a manager, actually sort of who you know. Yeah, my English teacher in high school was like, I know this guy who manages talent. And he was a very small manager, and he happened to get me that audition for a Pokemon. That's awesome. And it I certainly helps. Any, huh? T uh, sorry, I, I apologize no, for interrupting. No. But it does certainly help yeah. to take... Yeah. To, it doesn't help to just know somebody. Like someone in accounting is not right. going to be able to get you a job at, 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 at one of these companies. But if you are in an acting class with someone, right. or if you have a coach, or you've taken a class from a casting director, yeah. those are really, I mean, getting in front of those people is a great thing. But the industry, like, especially anime now, it's, it's huge. Yeah. Um, and it's just like any other industry now. You, there's a lot of, you know, auditioning, trying to get into it. You usually have to have an agent. But... Yeah. That's a whole panel in and of itself. You can't get an agent until you have work, but you can't really right. get work until you have an agent. So right. therein lies the problem. Yeah. But I'd say before hey. then, just find a community of people that love to do what you do, like online, and make your own content, do, do your own thing, and, and uh, try to make voice acting like one of the many things you can do. Try and get into the industry, like work in film business or work in TV or find a job in entertainment that like, makes oh, you yeah. happy. I That's do other acting stuff too. That's awesome. That's the perfect segue for what I was going to say. I took cl my first voice acting specific classes were with Tony Oliver, who like directs a ton of stuff all the time. And then I got an internship at Bang Zoom Entertainment in production. They don't have acting internships, you know. But I was like, I just want to see how the industry works. And like, I don't know, it might be helpful to just be around things. Um, and I do think that that was, that was extremely helpful for me to just understand everything. And yeah, you learn things. Yeah, you learn things. Yeah, you learn things. And then when Tony would come in to direct, he'd be like, Erica, do you want to sit in on this session tomorrow? And I'd be like, yes, please. So, you know, it's, it's, I did meet, you know, I did meet Tony. I'd met people at the studio, but I was, like, actively working to yeah. find those people and find that work, so. Yeah. Was it with yeah. Adventures in Voice Acting that you took the class? Yes, it was yeah, Adventures in Voice I've Acting. Yeah, I took one, too. Yes, back when I took it, it was, like, nobody knew about it yet, so it was basically a private eight-hour class. It was me and one other guy, what? and it was awesome. Now it's, like, they sell out immediately, and I'm like, ooh, it, I, I got in at the exact right time. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck to you. Thank you. Yay. Next question. Yeah. 
So my questions for Chris, first off, I want to say you're like my favorite voice ever. Uh, ever since I was a kid, I kind of hated Goku, but I love Vegeta because he was like the really awesome one that didn't follow any rules. And I wanted to ask you, how do you get into like the true emotion of the scene of the character? Like in All Might, when they're fighting Bakugo and Deku during the training, or especially during the Majin Buu saga, where he's saying goodbye to everyone when he's about to blow himself up. Well, I'll tell you what, in anime, we are super lucky, <clears throat> especially for those of us who really love sound or you really like make-believe, which are pretty much most actors. The coolest thing about anime is that you get an example of how much spirit the Japanese voice gave it, usually. <clears throat> and then, when you record, most studios allow you to have the music and the sound effects in your ear, and you get, uh, if you're one of the later people to record, you have the rest of the English cast in your ear. So you're just picking up the spirit of everything that is there. Like, the feeling that you get watching My Hero Academia or Dragon Ball is the feeling we get when we're recording it. Like, it's just, our voices hurt a lot more when we're done watching it. Uh, so really, I'm inspired, like the music in My Hero makes me cry half the time. Like the, the screaming in Dragon Ball makes me cry half the time. Um, Good too. But w the more you start dubbing, the more you don't have to even think about the process of it. Plus the writing has gotten really good. And uh, then you're just left like with, it's just you and the show. And so those shows are so powerful and so amazing that they just inspire the people that work on them. And usually you have a director that absolutely loves what he's doing too, so. Thank you. I just wanted to say you all are legends, but you all know this already. Um, and I wanted to ask a question in one of my favorite anime characters' voices, uh, Kuwabara. I'm gonna try. You're a mess. At what point did you realize, or all of you up there, oh, at what point did you realize that you loved what you did, and why do you love what you do? Um, I, I, I want to say that I've loved it since the first time I got to, to, do, to do anything. Like, I'd studied acting and stuff like that, but even just that, that was inspirational to get, study it, and then to be in a play or in a commercial thing. I loved it immediately. There wasn't any sort of like, well, someday I'll love that. Like, this is the best. This is, this is what makes me so happy. Awesome. Yeah, I, uh, you know, ever since I could talk, I wanted to perform. So I just, as a child, I didn't realize it was a job. I was like, this is just a fun activity that I can do. And I was in every, everything that would allow me to act. Um, and then once I was a grown-up, people were like, you should do this for your career. And I was confused because I didn't realize that <laughs> for my whole childhood. Um, so I've always, I've always loved it. It's so much fun. And I, I have always really loved, you know, cartoons and video games and anime. I got into anime in high school. And um, it's so cool to see that's, that's my job. That's what I make money off of now. How lucky is that? Like, that's so cool. I don't know. I always, I just really like it. I, there wasn't a specific moment. I had a moment when I was at Strasbourg. I was like 12 years old, and they sat us down for three whole hours in the morning and had us meditate and feel cold and feel hot. And the fact that they could do that to a room full of 12-year-olds and that I really enjoyed it and that I felt really good at it. I felt cold. I felt hot. I had no trouble doing any of this. Any of, anything that was asked of me, I was like, okay, I'm good at this, and I get to not be myself whenever I'm doing it. So that was, that was the moment I was like, I'm doing this for the rest of my life. And I kept, I kept re-upping that feeling. I kept like checking in with myself. I'm like, really? This is really hard. <laughs> this is not easy. And my parents are musicians, so they were like, are you sure you want this life? This is, this is not easy. <laughs> no, you don't want like a normal life? Okay. Um, but yeah, that's, yeah, I still want it. I still want to do it. There are still different aspects of acting that I want to explore, so yeah. It's wild. You've got to be a little bit out of your mind to do this. A little bit. A little bit. But I'm proud of that. Yeah, my, my mom taught dance at Strasbourg. and what? Yeah, and she also worked for a talent agent when she was in her 20s. So she, she was the one who made me not understand it was a career, because she was like, no, no. 
don't be an actor. It's just fun. <laughs> be a, a scientist. Or I want you to be happy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. She's like, actors are really needy. I don't think, you know, I don't know that you want that. And then um, look what happened. You can't, if you can't do anything else, do it. If you really can't picture yeah. yourself doing something else, do it. But if you can picture yourself, if you have another passion, they said that to me when I was a kid. I'm like, that's ridiculous. But lo and behold, a lot of people over the course of the years drop out and start doing something else, you know? because they can see themselves doing something else. I can't. It's well, just weird. First, I want to say, great coup bar impression, OK? Ah, and you. then um, I, I agree with all these people. Like, uh, I think when you, when you love doing this kind of stuff, it's just you like it immediately. And the one thing that has increased over the years is how grateful I am that I've been lucky enough to do this for so long. Uh, spe- I mean. Now, especially when it's, there's so many people that are interested in being in voice acting, I, I don't know if I would ever get a chance right now if I was auditioning. I mean, there's, you never know. It's a lottery, and I feel like, in some ways, I kind of won it, and I'm really lucky. Thanks. Yeah, I've had people tell me they're majoring in voice acting now in college, and I'm like, what? That's a thing you can do? <laughs> yeah. That did not exist 10 years ago. So, yeah. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi. All right, so my question was, when you guys are doing your uh, voice acting, do you take inspiration from dub first, or do you try to do like a clean sheet with your own voice and try to make it your own? Take inspiration from what? Say that one more time. From, from like, don't you know when you originally hear the dub version? Hmm. Oh, oh, the sub, oh, Oh, my fault, my fault. Uh, Not Japanese version, I think, Yeah, Japanese version, yeah. Well, I consider us to be helping to tell a story that's already been told by other folks, so the inspiration has to come from that. So uh, I've never worked on an anime project, to the best of my memory, where you don't, you don't listen to what's being done first in the Japanese. You don't listen to the seis, you, you know, and you luckily enough to like, listen to the music and the sound effects and all that kind of stuff, and it does help to set the mood. But um, it, it, it at least gives you a starting point. You're forgetting a very important bit of detail. What's that? We didn't record any of Dragon Ball with any Japanese references or music or sound design at all. They didn't give us any of that material. Oh, with Barry? Yes. And we never even got it. Like, once we started working on Dragon Ball, like, Kai or Super, but the entire Dragon Ball Z series, they're like, they never gave us the music or sound effects. That's a long time ago. I don't remember. Yeah. Wow. It's, we didn't hear any of it. We were just lucky that we even got kind of close to it. And I think my voice changed for some of those characters once I started hearing how the Japanese had done it, actually. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I've, uh, I've worked on games where we don't listen to the Japanese. Like Persona, sure. Persona we, I, I didn't hear the Japanese voice actor for that until after we'd been recording for six months and then we were doing the animation parts so then we would do it as if we were dubbing anime and I would like hear the original and I was like oh that's what she sounds like I had no idea um, but yeah for anime I do try to base it off of you know an inspiration like they said of what has already been done yeah on Pokemon we're not married to it we listen to it line by line um, but that's more for the director to get a sense of what's going on, and then I just trust my director. I do whatever I see on screen, and whatever makes sense. Um, but I don't, I, we're not married to the Japanese performances. Yeah, sure. it, it shouldn't be a gig of mimicry, but it should be like, oh, okay, they're very angry and they're yelling and there's two pauses. Like, that's very helpful to me. <laughs> yeah. All right, next question. Yes. <laughs> I just want to say that I appreciate everything that you guys do and all the hard work and hours you guys put in uh, to bring joy to all of us out here, and um, thank you for that. My question is, when you guys are developing the signature moves for your characters, um, which I know some of you have got more than others, but how taxing can that be on you to try to get it just right? Oh, it's the worst. (laughs) It is really painful, depending on the show that you're working on. but yeah, any of these shonen, they're, they're painful. You just hope that you don't actually have to like work on it. Your hope is that you get it right the first time so you Nail don't it. have to do it twice. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. Yeah, I liked in Sailor Moon, they only had me do like the transformation stuff 
the first time and then they reused it every time. <laughs> so I was like, awesome, love it. I didn't have to think about it the rest of the show. Except in the last session, they were like, do you want to do it one more time for nostalgia's sake? And I was like, sure. How did it go again? I forgot. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure I'm not everyone's favorite director for such things, but like if a move is repeated, unless it's specifically like recycled animation, I do want it done new every time just because it's a new situation. So, I do, yeah, I do right. like doing them again most of the time, except for when I work on Beyblade and it's so, he screams everything so loud and it's like 15 second screams and I black out and I'm like, please, it's the same animation. Can we just take it from before? Yeah. Yeah, on Pokemon we don't recycle anything unless it's the same animation like from the previous episode and they replay it at the top of the next episode. That's the only time I can really think of where we recycle anything. I'm screaming. <laughs> I scream a lot. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello. Uh, I just want to say, first of all, it's not to meet all of you. Without uh, watching your shows, my life would have been super boring, so thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my question, um, you know, uh, the roles of Ash, Vegeta, all of you, like, um, like those roles get like so like emotional, like people watching get so into the moments. Like, I was just wondering, can you name like a specific moment in your career where you've gotten like I don't know, super into your own role, like maybe it got you like emotional or something like that? Yeah, there was an episode where a Pokemon died. I don't want to give it away in case you're not up to it. Um, and it inspired me and my director, Lisa Ortiz, to start an organization promoting fostering for animals. Um, yeah, I fostered over 100 cats and kittens basically after that episode. My cat was dying at the time too, and that just kind of, it was a perfect storm, so. Yeah, uh, you can, one can say I got kind of emotional because of that episode. Oh, wow. Um, I, I tend to do it, like, I, I hate saying this, but I, I do it every time because it's my job to, I'm not doing an angry or doing a whatever, like, I, I am the character and I am angry, and the, the thing that's happening on screen is happening to me. So um, if the character is crying, I'm crying and my shirt's wet. And if the character's angry, I come out of the booth pissed off and I have to wind down. Like, I carry all of that with me. Uh, it's not just like, you know, Baba, screw you. Anyway, let's, where are we going for lunch? You know, I, I carry all of that with me. And uh, it's what, uh, you know, that's what crazy people do, so. Uh, there was a there's a scene in My Hero Academia. It's where All Might does the United States of Smash. I felt like I felt like that was basically where my career just peaked, and everything else is just downhill from there. Like it, I was a mess after that because I knew it was the end of that character. And All Might in My Hero Academia, and and I know it's kind of it low hanging fruit to even just call it that. Um, it's this character that's so like fatherly and nurturing and has had this entire career as sort of a superhero in this kind of world and then currently he can only do about an hour's worth of work and then he's really tired. I can really relate with that guy because, <laughs> and I have two girls, uh, one of them who turned 12 today. Uh, he, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> I told them, they're actually at the show and I said, please don't come to my panel. Um, enjoy yourself. Don't listen to your dad talk. Um, but yeah, that show just came around when I have two young girls myself and thinking a lot about what skills am I passing on and what am I, like, what am I giving to them? And so everything's just sort of culminated into that moment and when All Might was doing that final attack that I kind of knew was gonna be basically his last one, I was a mess. Wow. Well, I'm definitely gonna rewatch that after this. <laughs> so. oh. All right, we have time, guys, for our, so we our last question right here, our last question right here. But anyone else had a question, feel free to come to our tables. We'll hang out, we'll talk. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I can just stand on my TV, so you don't have to. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, with all the projects that y'all have done, what do you feel is your biggest I've made it moment? Like, when you're like, holy shit, I have fans, and like, this is where I am now in cipher language. Now that I've started doing conventions, that's, that's been my moment. So yeah. it took 16 years to get to that moment. It's not too long. <laughs> yeah, I feel like every time I come to a convention and 
I'm like, hope there's a person in my line. And then I walk out and there's a line and I'm like, wow. Wow. <laughs> they must like something that I did. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> yeah, pr- probably conventions and stuff as well. The, the, the first big one that I recall where I was just uh, super impressed, um, like, it took a moment to take it all in. We were premiering the dub for the first Full Metal Alchemist movie. Um, and it was at Anime Expo, and the room held like 2,500 people. It was something ridiculous like that, like it was the size of a football field. And about at every 100 feet, they had like another PA speaker so that you were hearing like an echo away in the back of it. Everyone got like, but the place was full. And I hadn't gone out to look at anything like that. I just was around for sound check hours early and then came out uh, to that many people who were screaming and yelling at it like it was a football game. Uh, and they were that enthused about it. And that, that felt crazy amazing. That was such a cool feeling to see that many people that loved it, not just showed like, oh, this is pretty cool, but like we're like, screaming and yelling for it. It was so cool. Yeah, the, the conventions for me starting out are not the same as they were now. Because when we were first promoting Dragon Ball, oh, yeah. the early years, the anime con- fans made it very clear how they felt about the dub of Dragon Ball which was not entirely faithful to the Japanese. Uh, so most of my experiences were like about eight people in the room going like, um, excuse me, why did you change the music? I'm like, what's it feel like to be a ruiner of yeah. things that I love? Yeah, exactly. So, but I do remember like we got to go to, uh, Sean Chemo and I got to go to Australia, which was like, oh my God, we get to go to Australia because we worked on this dub? And it was not only cool enough that we got to go there, but there, the, our autograph thing was on the third floor. And we ca- took this elevator up, and when the elevator doors opened, I swear there must have been like 500 people there that went nuts. And I felt like I was in the Beatles or something like that. And it was the coolest feeling of all time. I was like, I cannot believe that this is, this is where we've come. And that was a long time ago. Now it's even yeah, cooler. Yeah, that was like early 2000s, yeah. And I keep thinking like, yeah, we made it. And then we do a panel at Madison Square Garden. Or like, yeah, we made it. Or we fill up Hall H or something like that. It's the coolest thing. You know, you just unlocked a memory. I met you as a fan one time. Me? Uh-oh. Yeah, when I was in high school. I forgot until right now. Oh, goodness. <laughs> it was at Anime Expo, and you were signing with Caitlin Glass, I think. Okay. And I think Oron had come out recently. Yeah, and I, I, I was there for that. And everyone was, like, freaking out, and I was like, who's over there? And then I was like, oh, I know, I know their work. I oh, hopefully I was a decent human you being. You were, you were very nice. I think I got your autograph. It was very exciting. <laughs> I forgot all about that <laughs> until right now. It's very cool. Can you guys give a huge round of applause, everybody? Thank you so much, Chris, Mike, Eric, and Sarah. Thank you guys so much for joining us here at the ATL Comic Convention. One more time, guys, give a huge round of applause. Thank you. Thank you guys so very much. Thank you. Thank you. This is Erica Harlicker Stone, and you're watching Fandom Spotlight. Yay! Make sure to like and subscribe. Do it. Do it right now. It's free. You don't have to pay anything. I don't know why you aren't doing it. Seriously, I'm going to keep saying it until you do it. Okay, thank you. Yay! Remember to have fun and follow your fandom. Bye!